Hello friends, in this video we shall discuss the common pathology specimens that can be asked during your general surgery practical exam. In the part 1 of the video I have already discussed about how to approach a pathology specimen and the points that should be included during description of the specimen. In this video we shall discuss the following specimens in detail one by one. Let us start, start discussing the first specimen. This is a specimen of thyroid which is a butterfly shaped organ consisting of two lobes and is connected by isthmus. Very clearly you can see multiple nodules involving both the lobes and the isthmus and hence the pathology is multinodular goiter. Since the specimen consists of both the lobes and the isthmus, this is a total thyroidectomy specimen. On cut surface of the mounted specimen, areas of cystic regions as well as hemorrhages can be seen. The outer surface shows nodularity. The questions that can be asked with regards to this specimen is, what are the complications of multinodular goiter? So, the commonest complication can be compression of the trachea or the esophagus leading to compressive symptoms. There can be secondary thyrotoxicosis in around 35% of these patients. Large multinodular goiters can have some complication like hemorrhage. Malignant change, although uncommon, is known and there is increased incidence of follicular carcinoma in these patients. You can also be asked about what are the indications for surgical management. So compressive symptoms, retrosternal extension, neoplastic transformation are the common indications. Also cosmetic reasons can be one of the reasons for surgical management. At this place you can be asked about what are the different types of thyroidectomies. So a total thyroidectomy is when both the lobes as well as the isthmus of the thyroid is removed. When um, subtotal thyroidectomy is when the thyroid tissue is left in the tracheoesophageal fish, uh, groove, it is called as the th subtotal thyroidectomy. hartley dunhill's procedure is a procedure when a complete lobe on one side and a subtotal lobectomy on the other side is done. Hemithyroidectomy is when one lobe and the isthmus is removed. Next you can be asked about the different complications of thyroidectomies. So recurrent laryngeal nerve injury is one of the complications of total thyroidectomy. Also injury to the parathyroid glands can lead to hypocalcemia. Other complications can be hemorrhage, change of voice or hoarseness of voice can also be seen in total thyroidectomies. Let us go to the next specimen. This is a very common specimen kept in the exam. So this is a specimen of a gallbladder. The wall of the gallbladder appears thick and pale. You don't miss the stones at the bottom of the jar. And hence I call this as the specimen of cholelithiasis, possibly cholecystitis and the surgery done is cholecystectomy. Here you can be asked about the different types of gallstones. So the commonest stones are the mixed stones which are predominantly cholesterol and they are radiolucent. Other stones are cholesterol stones or pigment stones. Pigment stones can be of two types, black stones which are found in hemolytic anemia and brown stones which are primarily formed in the bile duct in 98% of the cases which forms the nidus of infection. You can also be asked about the different factors responsible for formation of gallstones. So metabolic factors like alteration in the concentration of the bile salts, lecithin and cholesterol can lead to formation of gallstones. The commonest factor responsible for formation of gallstone are stasis and infection. Hemolysis 
can lead to pigment stones. The next question that can be asked is what are the pathological characteristics of chronic cholecystitis? So characteristic gross appearance of a gallbladder in chronic cholecystitis is a shrunken thick walled gallbladder which is pale in color. Histologically the mucous membrane proliferates and projects into the lumen forming deep clefts which can be seen as Rokitansky Eschkopf sinuses. The muscle coat is atrophied and there is proliferation of fibrous tissue in the wall of the gallbladder and you can see infiltration of chronic inflammatory cells. As a surgeon you should know about the sequelae of acute cholecystitis. So with conservative management acute cholecystitis can resolve or it can lead to gangrenous changes leading to perforation. The perforation can be either localized or it can lead to frank peritonitis. You can also be asked about the different approaches of cholecystectomy, what is the triangle of safety etc which can also be discussed during your operation table. The next specimen is the specimen containing a large number of daughter cysts. The, the mounted specimen in the jar contains large number of white laminated membranes of varying sizes and hence I call this specimen as the daughter cyst of hydrated cyst. You should know the parasite that is the Echinococcus granulosus and the life cycle of the parasite. Definitive host is the dog which harbors the adult parasite. The intermediate host is the sheep which harbors the larval forms. An accidental host is man who gets infested by close contact with dog or sheep or by eating raw vegetables contaminated by the ova. The different layers of the cyst can also be asked. So we have the endocyst, ectocyst and the pericyst. The endocyst, the germinal layer lining the endocyst secretes externally the laminated membrane which contains the cystic structures and internally it secretes the hydrated fluid. In addition, the germinal layer forms pouching towards the lumen of the cyst which develops into brood capsules. Now initially these brood capsules are attached to the germinal layer by a pedicle and leading to formation of further scolysis. The ectocyst is the whitish laminated membrane externally and protects the inner contents of the cyst. The liver tissues in reaction to the hydrated cyst leads to fibrotic changes at the periphery of the cyst giving it a formation of pericyst. So the pericyst is actually the host tissue. At this stage you should, you should know what is malignant hydrated. So the parasite is Echinococcus multilocularis and the cyst characteristically lacks the different definite capsule and it grows and extends into a large area of this liver in a malignant fashion and hence it is called as malignant hydrated. Malignant hydrated is also characterized by peritoneal hydratidosis. Different complications of hydrated cysts can also be discussed. So a large hydrated cyst can lead to pressure effects leading to obstructive jaundice. The hydrated cyst can rupture into the biliary tree and the contents can cause obstruction leading to obstructive jaundice or it can rupture into the peritoneal cavity leading to peritonitis or even anaphylactic shock. A long standing hydrated cyst can get infected. So these are the different complications of hydrated cyst. Let us go to the next specimen. This is again a very common specimen which you all should be well versed with. This is a specimen of breast showing the nipple areola complex along with the dissected lymph nodes. There is a mass in the upper outer quadrant within the breast parenchyma. 
the skin overlying the tumor looks infiltrated also the nipple is retracted there are enlarged lymph nodes seen in the axillary axilla of the specimen i call this specimen as a modified radical mastectomy done for carcinoma of the breast now the examiner can either ask you questions on histological types so depending upon the cell of origin carcinoma of the breast can be a ductal carcinoma which arises from the epithelial cells lining the mammary duct or lobular carcinoma which arises from the cells lining the breast lo lobules depending upon the invasion the carcinoma can be either carcinoma in situ or it can be an infiltrating ductal carcinoma if the examiner asks you you should know about the rare types of carcinomas like this keras type medullary carcinoma colloid carcinoma inflammatory carcinoma and even paget's disease of the nipple another pathological question that can come up is regarding the scarf bloom rejection grading now this is a very important grading system and it prognosticates the tumor so it has three parts one tubule formation second nucleus size and third mitotic index each of these components has a score of 3 so the maximum richard uh, sin score is around 9 also you can be asked about the nottingham's combined histologic grade which is again based on the differentiation so grade 1 is well differentiated grade 2 is moderately differentiated and grade 3 is poorly differentiated a clinical form of question can be what are the different skin changes seen in carcinoma of the breast so pudy orange which is because of the subdermal lymphatic channel obstruction dithering which is infiltration of the cooper's ligament satellite nodules ulceration cancer and keuras i think you all are aware of these different clinical changes you can also be asked about the different modes of spread so a carcinoma of breast can spread directly infiltrating the skin or the chest wall it can spread via lymphatics to the axillary nodes internal mammary nodes the supraclavicular nodes or it can spread hematogenously to other organs leading to metastasis the tnm staging of carcinoma of the breast should be should be well versed with and can be asked either in your case presentation or the, along with the specimen as well next is the specimen of the slice of the breast along with the nipple areola complex on the cut section a lobulated mass occupying the entire breast is seen the overlying skin is normal and hence i call this specimen as a simple mastectomy specimen done for phylloid tumor there is no axillary tissue along with this specimen so that is why this is a simple mastectomy specimen now what is the histological appearance of phylloids so histological picture between a benign and a sarcoma should be known so more cellularity more pleomorphism and no more, more mitotic activity goes in favor of a sarcoma histologically a phylloids looks like a leaf like architecture due to the enhanced intracanalicular growth pattern the cleft like spaces lined by epithelium and hypercellular stroma gives it the leaf like appearance and hence the name phylloids the next question can be how will you treat a patient with phylloids so the normal uh, answer to this question is wide local excision that is excision of the tumor with the margin of normal tissue however in tumors like the, that in our specimen which are huge and occupying almost all the breast it may warrant a simple mastectomy also a recurrent phylloids which is a large enough may require a simple mastectomy
Let us now go to the next specimen. This is a specimen of kidney. I call it kidney because of the bean shaped organ and there is also a hilum. So if you see on the cut surface there is a upper pole has been replaced by a circumscribed pale yellowish mass with variegated appearance and there are areas of hemorrhage. I call this specimen as renal cell carcinoma and this is a nephrectomy specimen because the entire kidney is seen in this specimen. So here the discussion can be about the different cells of origin of renal cell carcinoma. So the renal cell carcinoma usually is an adenocarcinoma and it is derived from the renal tubular epithelial cells and the histological types are clear cells or granular cells or a combination of both. The classical clinical presentation of renal cell carcinoma is a triad of plank pain, gross hematuria and a palpable mass. And the treatment for renal cell carcinoma can also be discussed. Before treating you can be asked about what, how does it spread. So it can be either a direct spread into the pelvic alacial system where a patient may have gross hematuria or it can in the tumor thrombus can invade into the renal vein or the IVC. It can also um, breach the capsule. Hematogenous spread occurs to the lungs and the bones and lymphatic spread is much uncommon in renal cell carcinoma. So the initially the tumor is confined to the kidney and remains silent for a very long time and metastasis is very late in renal cell carcinoma. The treatment of choice is nephrectomy if a large tumor is there and if it's a small tumor less than 2 cm a, a nephron sparing surgery or a partial nephrectomy can also be possible. Next specimen is a specimen of kidney again because of the classical bean shaped organ and the presence of the hilum and the ureter is very clearly seen attached in this specimen. The cut surface shows gross dilatation of the pelvic alacial system with thinning of the renal cortex and hence I call this as a nephrectomy specimen due to gross uh, hydronephrosis. Now here you can be asked about what are the different causes of unilateral and bilateral hydronephrosis. So unilateral hydronephrosis can be caused because of congenital reasons like a uretocele or a PUG obstruction due to aberrant renal vessels. There can be etiologies inside the lumen like stones or tumor causes in the wall of the lumen ureter like stricture or outside the ureter leading to compression by either a carcinoma of the cervix or a retroperitoneal tumor or idiopathic retroperitoneal fibrosis. Causes for bilateral hydronephrosis are logically when either of the cause is involving both the ureters which is rare or more commonly there is obstruction at the neck of the urinary bladder. So the urethral obstruction or bladder obstruction in the form of uh, either a tight phimosis or a urethral stricture or a benign prostatic hyperplasia or carcinoma of the prostate. Next, how do the patients with hydronephrosis present? So the commonest presentation is a form of a renal lump or a constant renal pain. In patients, you can also see Dittel's crisis that is intermittent hydronephrosis. The pain disappears with passage of large quantity of the urine. Bilateral hydronephrosis can also lead to chronic renal failure, bladder outlet obstruction leading to infections or increased frequency urine can also be one of the symptoms. You can be asked about the evaluation of hydronephrosis and the different uh, radiological investigations. So USG ultrasound can delineate the cause of the hydronephrosis. It can 
tell you about the degree of dilatation of the pelvic collateral system. The assessment of the thickness of the renal cortical tissue can also be made on ultrasound. Also, you can make out the status of the opposite kidney during an ultrasound. DTPA scan is an investigation to assess the function of the hydronephrotic kidney. If it's a functional kidney, then you may treat the cause. But in cases of a non-functional kidney, you may have to go for a nephrectomy. Next is complications of hydronephrosis. It can lead to infection leading to pyonephrosis or hematuria or chronic renal failure. The next specimen is again the specimen of a kidney because of the bean shape. It is showing multiple small cysts throughout the kidney. And when you turn the specimen, you can see that some of the cysts are also showing hemorrhagic fluid. These cysts are not communicating with the pelvic collateral system. And hence, this is a specimen of polycystic kidney. So, a first obvious question that can be asked here is, how will you differentiate on gross appearance between polycystic kidney and a hydronephrotic kidney? So a polycystic kidney, there have cysts of varying sizes and these cysts do not communicate with the pelvic collateral system. However, in a hydronephrotic kidney, the cystic spaces in the kidney communicate with the pelvic collateral system leading to thinning of the renal cortex. So this is the most important differentiating point between a polycystic kidney and a hydronephrotic kidney. What is the clinical presentation of adult polycystic kidney disease? So most of these patients are asymptomatic and are found incidentally on imaging. Patients can present as young hypertensives that is 70 to 75 percent of patients may develop hypertension by the age of 20 years. Very rarely they may present with renal lumps, renal pain or hematuria due to rupture of the cysts. Advanced cases of polycystic kidney land up in chronic renal failure. What are the associated lesions in patients with polycystic kidney? So these patients may also develop polycystic diseases in the liver, pancreas and spleen. Also berry aneurysm that is aneurysm of the circle of villus is associated in these patients. Now how will you treat polycystic kidney? So the primarily the treatment of polycystic kidney disease is treatment of the hypertension, treatment of anemia. If the patient has chronic renal failure, he may require dialysis. Surgical intervention in the form of renal transplantation is done in patients with end-stage renal disease. So if you look at the specimen, this may not be a surgical specimen of nephrectomy because nephrectomy is not the treatment of choice. So this could be a post-mortem specimen also. What is the role of deroofing operation in cases of polycystic kidney? So deroofing operation is done for polycystic liver disease, but it is not very helpful in polycystic disease of the kidney. If at all the cyst is large enough leading to pressure over the ureter, you may consider ultrasound guided aspiration to decompress the cyst and deroofing operation has a very limited role. Let us now go to the next specimen. This is a specimen of testis with the spermatic cord. The testis is enlarged and if you see the cut surface of the testis, there is a grey white tumour replacing the entire testis. The tumour is homogeneous in appearance and lobulated. So a homogeneous and lobulated appearance of the tumour is in favour of seminoma of the testis. So this is a specimen of orchidectomy done for seminoma. As I have already mentioned, a homogeneous lobulated appearance is a seminoma. But if this is a variegated cystic appearance, it will be 
in favor of teratoma the questions that can be asked are what are the different histological types of testicular tumors so you have germ cell tumors which can be seminomatous or non seminomatous different types of seminomas can be either a typical seminoma which occur in men of 30 to 40 years a spermatocytic seminoma can occur in men older than 50 years an anaplastic seminoma which is a more aggressive tumor with a high chances of local invasion one anatomical or based question can be about the spread of testicular tumors here you should know about the lymphatic drainage of the testis so seminoma commonly spreads by lymphatics the first echelon of lymph nodes are in the para aortic region at the level of the renal veins there is a free crossover of lymphatics from the right to the left and later to the mediastinal nodes and later to the left supraclavicular lymph node involvement direct spread of tumor is very late because it is confined by the tough tunica albuginea but the direct spread can occur along the epididymis and the spermatic cord and scrotal invasion is very rare in testicular tumors teratomas on the other hand are prone for hematogenous spread and uh, choriocarcinomas can also have hematogenous spread to the lungs liver brain bones you can be asked about the different tumor markers which are done for the prognostication of testicular tumors so serum alpha fetoprotein and beta hcgs are elevated in patients with non seminomatous germ cell tumors hcg is more elevated in seminoma and alpha fetoprotein elevation indicates the presence of a teratomatous element how does a patient with testicular tumor present and what is the management so usual presentation is a painless testicular swelling secondary hydrocele can be associated if it's an advanced disease there can be an abdominal mass due to paraortic lymph node enlargement or enlargement of the left supraclavicular lymph nodes can lead to workout zones distant metastases to the lung and bones can give rise to symptoms of respiratory or bony pains in the management of testicular tumor one thing should be remembered that pineal aspiration cytology is a contraindication preventing it should not be done because to avoid scrotal breach so the treatment of choice is high inguinal orchidectomy following high inguinal orchidectomy if it's a pure seminoma and it's stage 1 post operative radiation to the paraortic nodes and the pelvic nodes and if scrotal irradiation even the, if there is scrotal breach then scrotal irradiation can also be required in stage 2 tumors adjuvant radiation to the retroperitoneum along with chemotherapy and the chemotherapy is usually a etopot etoposide and cisplatin or bleomycin and cisplatin for teratomas which are early diseases with a negative tumor marker following testic high inguinal orchidectomy you can keep the patient in follow up but if it's a stage 2 then it may require a nerve sparing rp lnd that is retroperitoneal lymph node dissection with or without chemotherapy The next specimen is a specimen of penis showing a proliferative growth involving the glands. If you turn the specimen, you will see very clearly that the resection margin is at least 3 cm proximal to the growth. And hence I call this as a partial penectomy specimen done for carcinoma of the penis. You can be asked about the different pre malignant conditions of the penis so bxo belenitis xerotica obliterans chronic belenopathitis 
phimosis, leukoplakia, erythroplasia of curette, the Bushke Lowenstein's disease, or varicose carcinomas are the pre malignant conditions for carcinoma of the penis. How does the carcinoma of the penis spread? So a direct spread is usually rare because the buck's fascia acts as a temporary barrier for invasion. However, once the buck's fascia is invaded, the tumor rapidly spreads and invades the corporal body. The first uh, or the commonest mode of spread for, for penile cancer is lymphatic spread to the inguinal lymph nodes either superficial or deep and the second stage is the uh, the second echelon is the ilac nodes hematogenous uh, spread is usually rare in a penile cancer here you should know about the lymphatic drainage of the penis so from the skin and the prepuce the, the lymphatics are drained into the superficial inguinal lymph nodes and from the glands the, and the lymphatics from the corporal body form the plexus at the base of the penis and then go into the uh, superficial inguinal nodes. They can cross over on either side and then into the deep inguinal lymph nodes. From the deep inguinal lymph nodes, they drain into the eye-like nodes. Now this is important because when you um, plan the management, the decision of uh, are, uh, of a lymph node dissection is based on this particular anatomy. So what can be the clinical presentation of patients with penile cancer? So, penile, uh, so uh, different presentations can be you can be given clinical scenarios. Like for example, uh, uh, the, uh, the for the penis partial penectomy with a proximal of minimum two centimeters margin is advocated, and you can be you can have a discussion on the management of the growing nodes. So the initial answer should be a two weeks of antibiotics followed by FNAC. If the FNAC is positive, the ileo inguinal lymph node on the affected side and the superficial lymph node dissection on the other side is advocated. Pelvic node clearance is done only if more than two inguinal lymph nodes are positive. Now, in case if the FNAC is negative, the role of prophylactic lymph node dissection is controversial. Patients who have fixed nodes will go for chemotherapy which is a taxane and platin based chemotherapy. Uh, you can also be asked about the Jackson staging and the TNM staging. So roughly the Jackson staging is where the stage 1 is where the tumor is confined to the glands, prepuce or both. Stage 2 is when the tumor extends into the shaft of the penis. Stage 3 is when the tumor with metastasis to the inguinal lymph nodes but these lymph nodes are mobile. And stage 4 are where the inguinal lymph nodes are fixed or there are distant metastases. Let us go to the next specimen. This is a specimen of urinary bladder which is cut open. The bladder wall shows a fungating cauliflower like ulcerated mass arising from the mucosa and filling up the entire lumen of the urinary bladder. The cut surface shows necrosis and hemorrhage. Since you can see the entire urinary bladder in this specimen, this is a specimen of a radical cystectomy done for carcinoma of the urinary bladder. You can be asked about the histological types of bladder cancers. So the most common type, more than 90% of bladder cancers are transitional cell carcinoma. Squamous cell carcinoma can be seen associated with chronic irritation, long term indwelling catheters or cystosoma. Uracal remnant can give rise to adenocarcinoma. What are the different etiological factors for development of bladder cancer? Occupational exposure to benzidine, aniline dyes, leather workers, cigarette smoking can lead to bladder cancer. Also, chronic cystitis 
associated with prolonged catheterization, cystosomiasis, pelvic irradiation in females, and chronic arsenic poisoning and are other etiological factors leading to development of bladder cancer. What is the clinical presentation of patients with bladder cancer? They can have painless hematuria. This is the commonest presentation. Patients can have recurrent attacks of cystitis, retention of urine or chronic constant pelvic pain. Presence of pain may suggest extra vesicle spread. Now, depending upon the histology, you can plan the management of bladder cancer. So, what do you mean by a superficial bladder cancer and how do you treat them? So, a non-muscle invasive cancer that is not involving the lamina propria, that is PTA, or if it involves the lamina propria but not the muscle, that is the pathological T1, are called as the superficial bladder cancers. So, the tre these are treated by TURBT, that is transurethral resection of bladder tumors, followed by adjuvant therapy. The follow-up for a single, well-differentiated or moderately differentiated tumor can be, um, a, uh, can be kept in follow-up. However, multiple tumors may require a 6 weeks of intravesical chemotherapy either with mitomycin C or adriamycin or a pathologically T1 tumor may require intravesical chemotherapy with BCG. The next question is, what is muscle invasive bladder cancer? So, anything invading the muscle, that is T2, or full thickness, that is T3, or paravesical extension, that is T4 tumors, are the advanced tumors. The treatment of these tumors are radical cystectomy with pelvic lymphadenectomy. Now, here you can be asked about the different reconstructions that can be done for following radical cystectomy. The most common reconstruction is the IEL condyle. If the lesion is very small and if it is probably an adenocarcinoma, a partial cystectomy can also be considered. But this is a very rare scenario. Let us come to the last specimen in this discussion. Now this is a specimen of spleen. Now you can very characteristically see the notches and the hilum of the spleen. Now this spleen is enlarged in size and on turning the specimen you can see multiple abscesses on the surface. So this is a specimen of splenectomy done for splenomegaly with multiple splenic abscess. Now you can be asked about the different indications for splenectomy. So blood and reticular endothelial disorders, hemolytic diseases like hemolytic anemias, myeloproliferative disorders, thrombocytopenic disorders can be the hematological indications of splenectomy. Splenectomy may be required for inflammatory di disorders like Pelty syndrome. Cryptogenic disorders or neoplasms can be one of the indications. Metabolic storage disorders leading to splenomegaly can be a etiology for splenectomy. And splenic trauma in case of emergency splenectomy is one of the commonest indication. Now here you as a surgeon you should know the different approaches of splenectomy. So you can have to you may have to do a splenectomy as an elective procedure or an emergency in splen splenic in trauma, in the setting of trauma. So whenever you are doing an elective splenectomy, you always approach or you take the control of the splenic artery and then you release the ligaments and then approach the hilum. But in cases where there are, where, where it's an emergency and a shattered spleen, you may have to tackle the hilum directly. At this stage, you can be asked about the different approaches like open and laparoscopic approach of splenectomy. The 
question can go for post splenectomy complications so the early complications can be respiratory complication which is commonest complication following splenectomy that is atelectasis of the left lung and pneumonia there can be venous thromboembolism subphrenic collection or even acute gastric dilatation delayed complication are in the form of infections that is opsy now once you say opsy you could be asked about what is opsy so opsy is overwhelming post splenectomy complication now these are rare but rapidly fatal conditions caused by capsulated organisms like the pneumococcus and the uh, h influenzae so these can either lead to meningitis or sepsis and in a patient with splenectomy the risk of opsy is lifelong and hence a patient who undergoes splenectomy needs splenectomy vaccination so what are the guidelines for splenectomy vaccination so if it is an elective splenectomy the patients should be vaccinated at least 14 days prior to the operation in patients who are undergoing emergency splenectomy the uh, vaccination should be done immediately or at least 14 days beyond the splenectomy the the vaccines that are used are uh, given that are pneumococcal vaccine meningococcal vaccine and the hip vaccine that is a hemophilus b conjugate vaccine so these are all the specimens that have been commonly asked in general surgery practical exam during your table viva i wish you a good luck for your exam and do the best thank you